Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations in the digital age. This is our night at the opera, the Metropolitan Opera. About 10 years ago, the Metropolitan Opera was plagued by declining sales and a theatrical stagnation. Then it changed course in 2006 with the appointment of Peter Gelb as its general manager. Peter Gelb gave the opera a new direction, and we're delighted, Peter, to have you with us to tell us about it. Happy to be here with you, Jim. Now, first, congratulations on, on this season, which is uh, going strong, uh, and uh, the uh, and congratulations that you've made the opera a source of uh, so much interest. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's essential that opera be in the public interest, otherwise uh, the public would lose interest in it. So, you know, I'm, I'm determined, and I have been from the very first day I arrived at the Met, to keep uh, opera and the Met in uh, somewhere in the in within the broader boundaries of the cultural mainstream. It's never going to be pop music or have that appeal, but uh, we have to keep trying to uh, inject it into the public's imagination through the productions we present on the stage and the way we connect with the larger public outside of the opera house as well. Well, let's talk about that. Your uh, chairman, uh, Ann Ziff, says you've given the opera a new vision. Uh, and uh, your friend uh, Andre Bishop, who is uh, the director of Lincoln Center Theater, an opera goer since 1958, says you've saved the Met from brontosaurism. <laughs> now, can you define this new vision for us? Well, when I first uh, came to the Met uh, in 2006, first of all, I'd, I had been uh, in a transition period for one year uh, while my predecessor, Joe Volpe, was showing me the ropes. Um, I was determining what that vision would be. In fact, I, I was uh, first approached for this job by Beverly Sills, uh, who was at, at the time was the chairman of the board of the Met, and uh, she urged me to come down and have an interview. At, this, at, at the time, I was the head of um, uh, Sony uh, Classical, the record label. So I somewhat reluctantly went to an interview uh, because I knew that I was a strange choice for the Met. I had never run an opera company. Of course, I, I had a background as a producer, and I, I knew a lot of opera stars. I'd worked with them. and other uh, classical music luminaries, um, but I didn't really so see. So you had met a few reigning divas. I had knew a few reigning mm -hmm. divas. I had worked with Jesse Norman and Kathleen Battle and uh, the Three Tenors mm -hmm. and on various projects when I was at Sony and before. So all, and all my life I've worked in classical music. I, I was an usher at the Met when I was a teenager, in fact. Um, but I, I, I had never run an opera house, and I was somewhat surprised that they would want to talk to me. When I went down there and, and was interviewed um, by the search committee of the board, I, I was actually quite uh, unstinting in my criticism of what I thought the Met had become. I mean, certainly I didn't criticize its great musical values, uh, which t to this day, thanks to James Levine and the superb forces of the Met Orchestra and Chorus, uh, shaped by him and by Donald Palumbo, our wonderful chorus director, uh, is the envy of the, of the opera world and has been for, for decades. But I, I was critical about the Met's um, image of elitism uh, and its disconnection from, from other cultural life in the city. And my concern, I, which I es expressed to the, to the search committee of the board, was that the Met was somewhat like an island that had been separated from the mainland. And that it needed to uh, build, we needed to build bridges back uh, to, to get it back in the public eye. And so I, I laid out a plan, which included uh, uh, it reinvigorating the Met theatrical, theatrically through, through the invitation of uh, to top stage directors, uh, uh, being more a, a, a assertive in terms of bringing in the top young stars, uh, not waiting for them to mature into fully blown uh, developed divas and divos, but g getting them on the ascent uh, onto the stage of the Met. And a very um, broad initiative to, to uh, use um, the Met's content uh, as captured on uh, television and, and radio uh, and, and amplify that effort to uh, make the Met more accessible to a broader public. The key to your strategy, at least uh, to me as an uneducated observer, has been the new productions. And you've brought 50 since 2006. There are six, I think, this season uh, out of uh, 24, 24 productions. And uh, it's been not without controversy. Uh, new productions are costly and uh, uh, sort of the old guard takes issue with uh, uh, the interpretations. Uh, can you tell us about new productions? Sure. I mean, I, I've learned that at the Met, anything I do is, is not without controversy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the uh, it doesn't you know the only thing I know for sure I is that if I didn't do anything um, in in, a, in an artistically proactive fashion, that the Met would uh, gra gradually collapse of its own um, weight, uh, because like any art form, uh, opera has to be renewed in order to be uh, relevant and, and, and to attract new audiences. So the trick, of course, of the Met has been to not alienate the older audience while at the same time trying to bring in a new audience because, and this is the, 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 the challenge of any aging institution in any field or any walk of life in business and, and art. Um, so th but my approach has basically been to, in an effort not to offend the old guard, um, and at the same time entice newcomers to the opera has been to invite directors who have one thing in common, that they are dedicated to telling the stories of the operas as composed and by the composer and as written by the librettist. Um, I think where opera companies have fallen into difficulties with their public has been where productions are produced that have little bearing uh, to the original material. And this is a natural danger of opera because the operatic repertoire is somewhat limited. The major pieces um, you can count in, you know, on, the, on the fingers of, 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 of not too many hands. I mean, there are, there are about 40 or 50 standard pieces that get reproduced over and over again. And so some directors, in an effort to be creative, uh, go overboard in deconstructing a story to make a mark for themselves as, as a creative force, when in fact that is not what opera needs. Opera needs is truly creative directors who are willing to, to stay within the, the boundaries of the, of the story of the opera and still be, and still be original and new. For example, um, the production of, uh, the famous production of Anthony Minghella, uh, who, who brought, one of the first things that I did at the Met was invite him to direct a new Madame Butterfly, which is, uh, simple and beautiful and different, and yet clearly tells the story of, of, of the sad geisha. And uh, the same is true of our productions of the Barber of Seville, which is playing, has played this year, which um, involved a very ingenious effort by Bart Shear to, to uh, bring uh, the audience closer to the action by building a passerelle, a walkway that extends beyond the pit and connects the, the stage literally with the, with the audience. So these are the kind of efforts that modern day directors do um, that are very effective. Not, of course, not everything works. Uh, we're very excited about this uh, new Mary Widow production that Susan Stroman is gonna be directing, the Tony Award winning director of uh, the producers and great choreographer as well. Um, uh, we have uh, already this season um, uh, introduced a number of, of new works that I think have largely been greeted with uh, success both by the older audience and the new audience. Well, these uh, new productions uh, quite typically, uh, seems to me anyway, uh, have had directors who uh, had a history of being theatrical directors quite largely, and uh, also uh, most of them, Susan Stroman's an exception, but most of them foreign-born. Uh, and uh, now, is there anything to be uh, uh, taken from this? No, there's no. I have no quota system. It's only my only my only requirement is, is that they're good. <laughs> and so, so what I, about the fact that they're all theatrical directors? I wouldn't say they're all theatrical directors. I'd say that most of the directors who I engage work in theater as well as opera. Um, that the directors who only work in opera are are less often engaged by me. But that, not to say that they aren't. Bec I mean, for example, David McVicker, um, the Scottish director, has already directed three or four productions at the Met, including a Cavalleria. New coming production. up, coming up, Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci. But uh, he directed the wonderful uh, Giulio Cesare last year, the Handel opera, um, the uh, historic uh, Donizetti Queen operas, uh, Anna Bolena and Maria Stuarda. Some of our biggest successes have come from him, and he c strictly directs opera. Same thing is true of Willie Decker who's minimalist uh, but very beautiful and a dramatically effective Traviata is playing at the Met this season. But then, but most of the directors I turn to are directors who, who do direct opera but only when they're inspired by the story to really do something special. So you had, uh, for example, your opener, and usually your opener is a new production. This uh, year was The Marriage of Figaro, The Notes of Figaro. The director was Richard Eyre, who had been the director of the National Theater in, uh, uh, in London. Um, as a matter of fact, let's watch uh, this outrageous duet from the uh, Marriage of Figaro between Susanna and Figaro with Marlis Peterson as Susanna and Ildar Adrazakov as Figaro. 
just amazing, but uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, Scottish uh, directors, uh, one of your new productions is Lady of the Lake uh, this season, and of course it was written by Sir Walter Scott, who was Scottish, so you brought in Paul Curran, a Scottish director. So I mean, you can't quite escape the uh, the inference that uh, foreign directors are value added to your production. Well, we, you know, the Met is always drawn upon the uh, greatest talents in the world, both in terms of singers and directors. That's nothing new that I've, that I've uh, instilled. I mean, we, you know, I, I certainly am very proud of uh, young American singers who develop, who we develop at the Met in our Lindemann Young Artist Program, who go on to become stars on our stage, and there are many of uh, such stories. Uh, as far as directors are concerned, I'm interested in just getting the best directors, the best designers. You know, we have American directors like Bart Shear, um, uh, Mary Zimmerman, um, there, are, there are many uh, American directors, English directors, German directors. For me, it doesn't make any difference where they come from as long as they're good. All right, let's uh, uh, talk about a, your superstar, Anna Netrebko. Now, she uh, has been your superstar. She's sung at the Met some 134 times in the past 12 years. And um, she starred in uh, Verdi's Macbeth this season. And of course, the director was a theatrical director who was Adrian Noble, who was uh, the leader of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Right. Well, let's watch Anna Netrebko because we have to watch Anna Netrebko. Uh, she's just so fabulous. blows me away. Now, uh, New Year's Eve, you're going to have a gala, uh, and it's the Merry Widow. You mentioned that, the choreographer Susan Stroman. You're going to have two superstars. Choreographer and director. And director. Right. And two superstars, in, uh, Renee Fleming, star of uh, Broadway musicals, uh, Kelly O'Hara as Valenciennes. The music is so uplifting by Franz Weyer. Let's uh, watch uh, Kelly O'Hara and company in a room rehearsal, a preview of New Year's Eve. The ladies of the chorus and the gentlemen adore us. And 
uplifting but uh, Peter uh, let's talk about another one of the new productions which excited great controversy which of course is uh, the death of Klinghoffer uh, before before I, I mention talk about the death of Klinghoffer the, I should mention that what makes the Merry Widow so interesting I think uh, for me as a producer is that it is a real merger of Broadway and opera I mean operettas in general are sort of fall between the two art forms, uh, and in a way, uh, the operette is the kind of the precursor of the Broadway musical. But to have uh, Broadway forces like uh, Kelly O'Hara and and uh, the the Grisettes, who we just saw, who are the showgirls who sing and, and dance in Maxine's, those are all Broadway chorus girls who uh, Susan Stroman uh, auditioned and and hired for this for this show. And to have William Ivy Long, who's won six Tony Awards, uh, d designing the costumes. Is a real so we have a real true Broadway invasion at the Met, which I'm very delighted about. Well, uh, let's move from uh, one kind of widow to another kind of widow with the death of Klinghoffer, a sad story, a tragic story, uh, and it created a tremendous uh, animosity, uh, really, from the Jewish community in New York, uh, many of whom are your funders. What's your take on uh, when? Why did you do it? And uh, uh, and you had the courage to resist the protests, and uh, and then you uh, showed it at the opera, but you withdrew it from high definition. Well, you know, now that the, the dust has settled, I mean, the opera has played and uh, its run is completed, um, looking back upon the experience, um, certainly I think I speak not only for myself, but for the entire company and for the board of the Met and for the donors who s loyally stood by the Met, that we were all very glad that we did go forward with the presentation. Of course, I had no idea it was going to be this controversial. This opera has been around for over 20 years. Uh, it has qu created some controversy in its earlier presentations, but in recent years it had met, been met with very little controversy, or none at all. It was presented at Juilliard a few years ago, and there, was, there were no protests at all. I guess the, time, the timing uh, being what it is today, and, and the world being so troubled in such a state of upheaval in the Middle East, and the fact that it was at the Metropolitan Opera some, somehow seemed to galvanize this, this huge protest. Um, but most of the protesters were people who had never seen the opera, who didn't even know it was an opera. We were besieged with emails telling us to cancel the play. Uh, so obviously their mm -hmm. instructions were, were somewhat uh, misguided. Um, and in fact, anyone who did see the opera uh, would realize, and did realize, I think, that, that the piece, although uh, attempting to uh, explain the the motivation of the terrorists and the, and the, and the, uh, the grief or, or the, the um, beef of the Palestinian people uh, is in no way uh, sympathetic to the acts of terrorism and is wholly sympathetic to the poor Klinghoffers, both Mr. Klinghoffer, who was murdered, uh, and Mrs. Klinghoffer, who has the final moving aria in the piece. Anyone who saw the opera walked away from the Met knowing that this was a sympathetic portrayal and uh, of the Klinghoffers, and I think that's ultimately what diffused the controversy. Because well, one person who walked away from the opera was uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the United States Supreme Court who said she saw nothing anti-Semitic about it. Well, it certainly wasn't anti-Semitic, and it was not only not anti-Semitic, it was, it was very sympathetic to the plight of the Klinghoffers, and clearly is a, a, if it's a tract about anything, it's a tract of, of, against mindless hate and animosity, which the world, unfortunately, has far too much of. One of the uh, extraordinary features of your stewardship uh, is uh, bringing uh, the opera, which uh, in the past was regarded as a form of elitist, highbrow entertainment, to uh, masses of people. And uh, you've done it with uh, Met HD, and you've done it with uh, uh, a simulcast in the plaza of Lincoln Center and Times Square. Uh, really uh, quite remarkable. Well, uh, tell us what your uh, thinking was behind that. Well, it really, my thinking behind it was really to open the Met up. I mean, I think that people, if, if opera is to have a future, and I certainly hope it does, people, new audiences need to be exposed to the art form. So it's not enough to bring dynamic new stagings on, onto, the, onto the stage of the Met. It also is necessary to 
connect the Met to the largest number of people possible. Um, I know that opera is not for everyone, but if we don't give people a chance to experience it uh, in movie theaters, on the radio, in Times Square, uh, we will never be able to bring in new audiences. So the HD transmissions, which began in just a few theaters in 2006, now are seen uh, by in over 2,000 theaters in 68 countries. Uh, we are seen live on a Saturday matinee in New York that we're transmitting live into movie theaters. It's seen from the West Coast to as far east as Jerusalem and Moscow and as far north as inside the Arctic Circle in the little city of Tromso in Norway and as far south as the tip of Argentina. Wow, now that's about $20 a ticket. How much is a ticket in the orchestra for uh, typically? Well, a ticket in the orchestra can be as much as uh, three or four hundred dollars, but also we have a program in an effort to democratize our, our ticket pricing uh, and ticket sales. We have a rush ticket program where you can get online uh, on a first-come, first-served basis uh, orchestra seats for as little as twenty dollars. So we really try to um, draw as many people into the Met as well as into movie theaters with, with price incentives that get, make it worthwhile to experience opera and, and to we want to hook people and get them interested. A well, word about economics. Uh, you faced a serious challenge this season with the possibility of a strike, and then you made a deal with uh, the unions, which involved some cost cutting, some drastic cost cutting. Have you? Uh, and the unions were critical of new productions as being uh, too expensive. Right. Uh, so, uh, what what's happening there? Of course, what makes the new production so expensive is, is, is largely the, 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 cost, the cost of making them. So, <laughs> so the uh, you know I think the unions, um, the union employees, uh, did not appreciate, of course, at first the effort on, on our part to reduce costs by, by by gaining wage concessions, and that's perfectly understandable. These people are the best in the world. Uh, the orchestra, the chorus, the stagehands, all the personnel who work at the Met are at the very top of their class, and. Um, it's not that they don't deserve to be paid handsomely, they do, it just is, you know, the economics of opera uh, are such that we can't afford that. So we ultimately reached an agreement after some rancorous uh, debate uh, that would involve an equality uh, of sharing of cuts so that the, both the uh, unionized employees have taken a reduction, the administrative staff has taken a reduction, and we've also committed to cut another $11 million out of the budget. So altogether, we have reduced our expenses by $20 million a year for the next four years. Have uh, you had to raise ticket prices as a result of the union contract? We have tried to keep ticket prices um, at, at basically where they are. There are slight raises in certain places. Other tickets are less expensive. You know, it's, it's, as I said earlier, there's a, such a wide variety of ticket pricing that it's possible to experience the Met in the Opera House or outside the Opera House in a movie theater for as little as $20. Um, so I have a question for you, Peter Gelb. Uh, will uh, your success at the Metropolitan Opera spoil Peter Gelb? I, I don't think I'm capable of being spoiled. I have too much to worry about. You know, the Metropolitan Opera, there's a, we have four, four, four different operas playing in repertory every week. We have seven performances a week. I have a clause in my contract that says I have to be available on a 24-7 basis. I feel like a doctor on call. There is, at any moment, something could happen. Either a singer could get sick or something could go wrong backstage. We have a, a, a medical station right off the stage right where, where we can, with a hotline to Roosevelt Hospital in case somebody gets injured. You know, the Met is, has 3,000 people working there. There are so many moving parts. Um, I wouldn't have time to be spoiled, <laughs> believe me. Don't know how you do it, but thank you so much. This has been marvelous. I think since it's the end, we should uh, end with the beginning. Uh, which is uh, the dress rehearsal, opening night, the marriage of Figaro, Mozart's immortal opera, known so pio, I don't know anymore what I am, with Isabel Leonard as Cherubino, and here is that. <laughs>
just awesome, Peter, and thank you so much for coming by. Thanks so this much, Jim. This is wonderful, and thank you for coming by. Uh, next week, tune in for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best. Thank you.